Wind, Sand, and Stars Chapter 2 The Men Madamus is one airline pilot, and Guillaume another, of whom I shall write briefly, in order that you may see clearly what I mean when I say that in the mold of this new profession a new breed of men has been cast. A handful of pilots, of whom Mermos was one, surveyed the Casablanca Dakar line across the territory inhabited by the refractory tribes of the Sahara. Motors in those days being what they were, Mermos was taken prisoner one day by the Moors. The tribesmen were unable to make up their minds to kill him, kept him a captive a fortnight, and he was eventually ransomed. Whereupon he continued to fly over the same territory. When the South American line was opened up, Mermos, ever the pioneer, was given the job of surveying the division between Buenos Aires and Santiago de Chile. He who had flung a bridge over the Sahara was now to do the same over the Andes. They had given him a plane whose absolute ceiling was 16,000 feet and had asked him to fly it over a mountain range that rose more than 20,000 feet into the air. His job was to search for gaps in the Cordilleras. He who had studied in the face of the sands was now to learn the contours of the peaks, those cracks whose scarves of snow flutter re restlessly in the winds, whose surfaces are bleached white in the storms, whose blustering gusts sweep through the narrow walls of their rocky corridors and force the pilot to a sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mermos enrolled in this war in complete ignorance of his adversary, with no notion at all of the chances of coming forth alive from battle with this enemy. His job was to try out for the rest of us. And, trying out one day, he found himself prisoner of the Andes. Mermos and his mechanic had been forced down at an altitude of 12,000 feet, on a table land at whose edges the mountain dropped sheer on all sides. For two mortal days they hunted a way off this plateau, but they were trapped. Everywhere the same sheer drop, and so they played their last card. Themselves still in it, they sent the plane rolling and bouncing down an incline, over the rocky ground until it reached the precipice, went off into air, and dropped. In falling, the plane picked up enough speed to respond to the controls. Mermos was able to tilt its nose in the direction of a peak, sweep over the peak, and... While the water spurted through all the pipes burst by the night frost, the ship, already disabled after only seven minutes of flight, he saw beneath him, like a promised land, the Chilean plain. And the next day he was at it again. When the Andes had been thoroughly explored and the technique of the crossings perfected, Mermas turned over this section of the line to his friend Guillaume and set out to explore the night. The lighting of our airports had not yet been worked out. Hovering in the pitch-black night, Mermos would land by the faint glimmer of three gasoline flares lined up at one end of the field. This trick, too, he taught us, and then, having tamed the night, he tried the ocean. He was the first in 1931 to carry the mails in four days from Toulouse to Buenos Aires. On his way home, he had engine trouble over a stormy sea in mid-Atlantic. A passing steamer picked him up with his mails and his crew. Pioneering thus, Mermas had cleared the desert, the mountains, the night, and the sea. He had been forced down more than once in desert, in mountain, in night, and in sea. And each time that he got home safely, it was but to start out again. Finally, after a dozen years of service, Having taken off from Dakar bound for, bound for Natal, he radioed briefly that he was cutting off his rear right-hand engine. Then, silence. There was nothing particularly disturbing in this news. Nevertheless, when ten minutes had gone by without report, there began for every radio station on the South Atlantic line, from Paris to Buenos Aires, a period of anxious vigil. 
it would be ridiculous to worry over someone ten minutes late in our day-to-day -day existence. But in the air mail service, ten minutes can be pregnant with meaning. At the heart of this dead slice of time, an unknown event is locked up. Insignificant it may be, a mishap possibly. Whatever it is, the event has taken place. Fate has pronounced a decision from which there is no appeal. An iron hand has guided a crew to a sea landing that may have been safe and may have been disastrous. And long hours must go by before the decision of the gods is made known to those who wait. We waited. We hoped. Like all men at some time in their lives, we lived through that inordinate expectancy, which, like a fatal malady, grows from minute to minute harder to bear. Even before the hour sounded, in our hearts many among us were already sitting up with the dead. All of us had the same vision before our eyes. It was a vision of a cockpit, still inhabited by living men. But the pilot's hands were telling him very little now and the world in which he groped and fumbled was a world he did not recognize. Behind him, in the glimmer of the cabin light, a shapeless uneasiness floated. The crew moved to and fro, discussed their plight, feigned sleep. A restless slumber it was, like the stirring of drowned men. The only element of sanity, of intelligibility, was the whirring of the three engines with its reassuring evidence the time still existed for them. We were haunted for hours by this vision of a plane in distress, but the hands of the clock were going round, and little by little it began to grow late. Slowly the truth was borne in upon us that our comrades would never return, that they were sleeping in that South Atlantic whose skies they had so often ploughed. Mermos had done his job and slipped away to rest. Like a cleaner who, having carefully bound his sheaf, lies down in the field to sleep. When a pilot dies in the harness, his death seems something that inheres in the craft itself, and in the beginning the hurt it brings is perhaps less than the pain sprung of a different death. Assuredly he has vanished, has undergone his ultimate mutation but his presence is still not missed as deeply as we might miss bread. For in this craft we take it for granted that we shall meet together only rarely. Airline pilots are widely dispersed over the face of the world. They land alone at scattered and remote airports, isolated from each other, rather in the manner of sentinels, between whom no words can be spoken. It needs the accident of journeyings to bring together here or there the dispersed members of this great professional family. Round the table in the evening at Casablanca, at Dakar, at Buenos Aires, we take up conversations interrupted by years of silence. We resume friendships to the accompaniment of buried memories. And then we are off again. Thus is the earth at once a desert and a paradise. Rich in secret hidden gardens, gardens inaccessible, to, but to which the craft leads us ever back, one day or another. Life may scatter us and keep us apart. It may prevent us from thinking very often of one another, but we know that our comrades are somewhere out there. Where, one can hardly say. Silent, forgotten, but deeply faithful. And when our path crosses theirs, they greet us with such manifest joy, shake us so gaily by the shoulders. Indeed, we are accustomed to waiting. Bit by bit, nevertheless, it comes over us that we shall never again hear the laughter of our friend, that this one garden is forever locked against us. And at that moment begins our true mourning. Which though it may not be re which way which though it may not be rending, is yet a little bitter. For nothing in truth can replace that companion. Old friends cannot be created out of hand. Nothing can match the treasure of common memories, of trials endured together, 
of quarrels and reconciliations and generous emotions. It is idle, having planted an acorn in the morning, to expect that afternoon to sit in the shade of an oak. So life goes on. For years we plant a seed, we feel ourselves rich, and then come other years, when time does its work, and our plantation is made sparse and thin. One by one our comrades slip away, deprive us of their shade. This, then, is the moral taught to us by Mermas and his kind. We understand better because of him that what constitutes the dignity of a craft is that it creates a fellowship, that it binds men together and fashions for them a common language. For there is but one veritable problem, the problem of human relations. We forget that there is no hope of joy except in human relations. If I summon up those memories that have left me an enduring savor, if I draw up the balance sheet of the hours in my life that have truly counted, surely I find only those that no wealth could have procured me. True riches cannot be bought. One cannot buy the friendship of a madamus, of a companion to whom one is bound forever by ordeals suffered in common. There is no buying the night flight with its hundred thousand stars, its serenity, its few hours of sovereignty. It is not money that can procure for us that new vision of the world won through hardship. Those trees, flowers, women, those treasures made fresh by the dew and color of life, which the dawn restores to us. This concert of little things that sustain us and constitute our compensation. Nor that night we lived through the th we lived through in the land of the unconquered tribes of the Sahara, which now floats into my memory. Three crews of Aeropostale men had come down at the fall of day on the Rio de Oro coast, in a part of the Sahara whose denizens acknowledge no European rule. Rigel had landed first with a broken connecting rod. Bourgat had come along to pick up Rigel's crew, but a minor accident had nailed him to earth. Finally, as night was beginning to fall, I arrived. We decided to salvage Bourgat's ship, but we should have to spend the night and do the job of repair by daylight. Exactly on this spot, two of our comrades, Gour and Erable, had been murdered by the tribesmen a year earlier. We knew that a raiding party of 300 rifles was at this very moment encamped somewhere nearby, round Cape Bojador. Our three landings had been visible from a great distance, and the Moors must have seen us. We began a vigil which might turn out to be our last. Altogether there were about ten of us, pilots and mechanics, when we made ready for the night. We unloaded five or six wooden cases of merchandise out of the hold, emptied them, and set them about in a circle. At the deep end of each case, as in a sentry box, we set a lighted candle, its flame poorly sheltered from the wind. So, in the heart of the desert, on the naked rind of the planet, in an isolation like that of the beginnings of the world, we built a village of men. Sitting in the flickering light of the candles on this kerchief of sand, on this village square, we waited in the night. We were waiting for the rescuing dawn, or for the moors. Something I know not what lent this night a savor of Christmas. We told stories, we joked, we sang songs. In the air there was that slight fever that reigns over a gaily prepared feast. And yet we were infinitely poor, wind, sand, and stars. The austerity of Trappists. But on this badly lighted cloth, a handful of men who possessed nothing in the world but their memories were sharing invisible riches. We had met at last. Men travel side by side for years, each locked up in his own silence or exchanging those words which carry no freight till danger comes. Then they stand, shoulder to shoulder. They discover that they belong to the same family. They wax and bloom in the recognition of fellow beings. 
they look at one another and smile. They are like the prisoners set free who marvels at the immensity of the sea. Happiness. It is useless to seek it elsewhere than in the warmth of human relations. Our sordid interests imprison us within their walls. Only a comrade can grasp us by the hand and haul us free. And these human relationships must be created. One must go through an apprenticeship to learn the job. Games and risk are a help here. When we exchange manly handshakes, compete in races, join together to save one of us who is in trouble, cry aloud for help in the hour of danger, only then do we learn that we are not alone on earth. Each man must look to himself to teach him the meaning of life. It is not something discovered. It is something molded. These prison walls that this age of trade has built around us, we can break down. We can still run free, call to our comrades, and marvel to hear once more, in response to our call, the pathetic chant of the human voice. Guillaume, old friend, of you too, I shall say a few words. Be sure that I shall not make you squirm with any clumsy vaunting of your courage and your professional valor. In telling the story of the most marvelous of your adventures, I am after something quite different. There exists a quality which is nameless. It may be gravity, but the word does not satisfy me, for the quality I have in mind can be accompanied by the most cheerful gaiety. It is the quality of the carpenter face to face with his block of wood. He handles it, he takes its measure. Far from treating it frivolously, he summons all his professional virtues to do it honor. I once read, Guillaume, a tale in which your adventure was celebrated. I have an old score to settle with the infidel who wrote it. You were described as abounding in the witty sallies of the street Arab, as if courage consisted in demeaning oneself to schoolboy banter in the midst of danger and the hour of death. The man did not know you, Guillaume. You never felt the need of cheapening your adversaries before confronting them. When you saw a foul storm, you said to yourself, here is a foul storm. You accepted it, and you took its measure. These pages, Guillaume, written out of my memory, are addressed in homage to you. It was winter, and you had been gone a week over the Andes. I had come up from farthest Patagonia to join Delay at Mendoza. For five days the two of us, each in his plane, had ransacked the mountains unavailingly. Two ships! It seemed to us that a hundred squadrons navigating for a hundred years would not have been enough to explore that endless cloud-piercing range. We had lost all hope. The very smugglers themselves, bandits who would commit a crime for a five peso note, refused to form a rescue party out of fear of those counterforts. We should surely die, they said. The Andes never gave up a man in, in winter. And when Dele and I landed at Santiago, the Chilean officers also advised us to give you up. It is midwinter, they said. Even if your comrade survived the landing, he cannot have survived the night. Night in those passes changes a man to ice. And when, a second time, I slipped between the towering walls and giant pillars of the Andes, it seemed to me I was no longer seeking, but was now sitting up with your body in the silence of a cathedral of snow. You had been gone a week, I say, and I was lunching between flights in a restaurant in Mendoza when a man stuck his head in the door and called out. They found Guillaume! All the strangers in the restaurant embraced. Ten minutes, minutes later I was off the ground, carrying two mechanics, Lefebvre and Abri. Forty minutes later I had landed alongside a road, having recognized from the air, I know not by what sign, the car in which you were being brought down from San Rafael. I remember that we cried like fools. We put our arms around the living Guillaume, 
resuscitated the author of his own miracle. And it was at that moment that you pronounced your first intelligible sentence, a speech admirable in its human pride. I swear that what I went through, no animal would have gone through. Later you told us the story. A storm that brought 15 feet of snow in 48 hours down on the Chilean slope had bottled up all space and sent every other mail pilot back to his starting point. You, however, had taken off in the hope of finding a rift in the sky. You found this rift, this trap, a little to the south. And now, at 20,000 feet, the ceiling of clouds being a couple of thousand feet below you and pierced only by the highest peaks, you set your course for Argentina. Down currents sometimes fill pilots with a strange uneasiness. The engines can run on, but the ship seems to be sinking. You jockey to hold your altitude. The ship loses speed and goes mushy. And still you sink. So you give it up, afraid that you may have jockeyed too much, and you let yourself drift to right or left, striving to put at your back a favorable peak, that is, a peak off which the winds rebound as off a springboard. And yet you go on sinking. The whole sky seems to be coming down on you. You begin to feel like the victim of some cosmic accident. You cannot land anywhere. You try in vain to turn round and fly back into those zones where the air, as dense and solid as a pillar, had held you up. That pillar has melted away. Everything here is rotten, and you slither about in a sort of universal decomposition, while the cloud bank rises apathetically, reaches your level, and swallows you up. It almost had me in a corner once, you explained, but still, I wasn't sure I was caught. When you get up above the clouds, you run into those down currents that seem to be perfectly stationary for the simple reason that in that very high altitude, they never stop flowing. Everything is queer in the upper range. And what clouds? As soon as I felt I was caught, I dropped the controls and grabbed my seat for fear of being flung out of the ship. The jolts were so terrible that my leather harness cut my shoulders and was ready to snap. And what, with the frosting on the panes, my artificial horizon was invisible, and the wind rolled me over and over like a hat in a road, from 18,000 feet down to 10. At 10,000 I caught a glimpse of a dark horizontal blot that helped me ride the ship. It was a lake, and I recognized, his, recognized it at what they call, as what they call Laguna Diamante. I remembered that it lay at the bottom of a funnel, and that one flank of the funnel, a volcano called Maipu, ran up to about 20,000 feet. There I was, safe out of the clouds, but I was still blinded by the thick whirling snow, and I had to hang on to my leg if I wasn't to crash into one of the sides of the funnel. So down I went, and I flew round and round the lake, about 150 feet above it, until I ran out of fuel. After two hours of this, I set the ship down on the snow, and over on her nose she went. When I dragged myself clear of her, I stood up. The wind knocked me down. I stood up again. Over I went a second time. So I crawled under the kick cockpit and dug me out of shelter in the snow. I pulled a lot of mail sacks around me, and there I lay for two days and two nights. Then the storm blew over, and I started to walk my way out. I walked for five days and four nights. But what was there left of you, Guillaume? We had found you again, true, but burned to a crisp, but shriveled, but shrunken into an old woman. That same afternoon I flew you back to Mendoza, and there the cool white sheets flowed like a balm down the length of your body. They were not enough, though. Your own foundered body was an encumbrance. You churned and twisted in your sleep, 
unable to find lodgment for it. I stared at your face. It was splotched and swollen, like an overripe fruit that has been repeatedly dropped on the ground. You were dreadful to see, and you were in misery, for you had lost the beautiful tools of your work. Your hands were numb and useless, and when you sat up on the edge of your bed to draw a free breath, your frozen feet hung down like two dead weights. You had not even finished your long walk back. You were still panting, and when you turned and stirred on the pillow in search of peace, a procession of images that told you that you could not escape, a procession waiting impatiently in the wings, moved instantly into action under your skull. Across the stage of your skull it moved, and for the twentieth time you fought once more the battle against these enemies that rose up out of their ashes. I filled you with herb teas. Drink, old fellow. You know what amazed me? Boxer victorious, but punch-drunk and scarred with blows, you were reliving your strange adventure. You could divest yourself of it only in scraps, and as you told your dark tale, I could see you trudging without ice axe, without ropes, without provisions, scaling calls, 15,000 feet in the air, crawling on the faces of vertical walls, your hands and feet and knees bleeding in a temperature 20 degrees below zero. Voided bit by bit of your blood, your strength, your reason, you went forward with the obstinacy of an ant, retracing your steps to go round an obstacle, picking yourself up after each fall to earth, climbing slopes that led to abysses ceaselessly in motion, and never asleep. For had you slept from that bed of snow, you would never have risen. When your foot slipped and you went down, you were up again in an instant, else you had been turned into stone. A cold was petrifying you by the minute, and the price you paid for taking a moment too much of a rest when you fell was the agony of revivifying dead muscles in your struggle to rise to your feet. You resisted temptation. I meet snow, you told me. A man loses his instinct of self-preservation. After two or three or four days of tramping, all you think about is sleep. I would long for it. But then I would say to myself, if my wife still believes I am alive, she must believe that I am on my feet. The boys all think that I am on my feet. They have faith in me, and I am a skunk if I don't go on. So you tramped on, and each day you cut out a bit more of the opening of your shoes so that your swelling and freezing feet might have room in them. You confided this you confided to me this strange thing. As early as the second day, you know, the hardest job I had was to force myself not to think. The pain was too much, and I was really up against it too hard. I had to forget that, or I shouldn't have had the heart to go on walking. But I didn't seem able to control my mind. It kept working like a turbine. Still, I could more or less choose what I was to think about. I tried to stick to some film I'd seen or book I'd read. But the film and the book would go through my, mind, through my mind like lightning. And I'd be back where I was, in the snow. It never failed. So I would think about other things. There was one time, however, when, having slipped and finding yourself stretched flat on your face in the snow, you threw in your hand. You are like a boxer, emptied of all passion by a single blow, lying and listening to the seconds drop one by one into a distant universe, until the tenth second fell, and there was no appeal. I've done my best, and I can't make it. Why go on? All that you had to do in the world to find peace was to shut your eyes. So little was needed to blot out the world the cracks and ice and snow that dropped those miraculous eyelids and there was an end of blows, of stumbling falls, of torn muscles and burning ice, of that burden of life you were dragging along like a worn-out ox, a weight heavier than any wain or cart. 
Already you were beginning to taste the relief of the snow that had been now become an insidious poison. This morphia that was filling you with beatitude. Life crept out of your extremities and fled to collect round your heart, while something gentle and precious snuggled in close at the center of your being. Little by little your consciousness deserted the distant regions of your body, and your body, that beast now gorged with suffering, lay ready to participate in the indifference of marble. Your very scruples subsided. Our cries ceased to reach you, or, more accurately, changed for you into dream cries. You were happy now, able to respond by long, confident dream strides, strides that carried you effortlessly towards the enchantment of the plains below. How smoothly you glided into this suddenly merciful world. Guillaume, you miser. You had made up your mind to deny us your return, to take your pleasures selfishly and without us, among your white angels in the snows. And then remorse floated up from the depths of your consciousness. The dream was spoiled by the eruption of bothersome details. I thought of my wife. She would be penniless if she couldn't collect the insurance. Yes, but the company... When a man vanishes, his legal death is postponed for four years. This awful detail was enough to blot out the other visions. You were lying face downward on a bed of snow that covered a steep mountain slope. With the coming of summer, your body would be washed with this slush down into one of the thousand crevasses of the Andes. You knew that. But you also knew that some fifty yards away, a rock was shutting up out of the snow. I thought, if I get up, I may be able to reach it, and if I can prop myself up against this rock, they'll find me there next summer. Once you were on your feet again, you tramped two nights and three days, but you did not then imagine that you would go on much longer. I could tell by different signs that the end was coming. For instance, I had to stop every two or three hours to cut my shoes open a bit more or, and massage my, sm my swollen feet. Or maybe my heart would be going too fast. But I was beginning to lose my memory. I had been going on a long time when suddenly I realized that every time I stopped, I forgot something. The first time it was a glove. And it was cold. I had put it down in front of me and had forgotten to pick it up. The next time it was my watch, then my knife, then my compass. Each time I stopped, I stripped myself of something vitally important. I was becoming my own enemy. And I can't tell you how it hurt me when I found that out. What saves a man is to take a step, then another step. It is always the same step, but you have to take it. I swear that what I went through no animal would have gone through. This sentence, the noblest ever spoken, this sentence that defines man's place in the universe, that honors him, that reestablishes the true hierarchy, floated back into my thoughts. Finally, you fell asleep. Your consciousness was abolished. But forth from this dismantled, burnt, and shattered body, it was to be born again like a flower put forth gradually by the species which itself is born of the luminous pulp of the stars. The body, we may say, then, is but an honest tool. The body is but a servant. And it was in these words, Guillaume, that you expressed your pride in the honest tool. With nothing to eat, after three days on my feet, well, my heart wasn't going any too well. I was crawling along the side of a sheer wall, hanging over space, digging and kicking out pockets in the ice so that I could hold on, when, all of a sudden, my heart conked. It hesitated, started up again, beat crazily. I said to myself, if it hesitates a moment too long, I drop. I stayed still and listened to myself. Never, never in my life have I listened as carefully to a motor as I listened to my heart, me hanging there. I said to it, Come on, old boy, go to work. Try beating a little. 
That's good stuff my heart is made of. It hesitated, but it went on. You don't know how proud I am of that heart. As I said in that moment in Mendoza, where I sat with you, you fell finally into an exhausted sleep. And I thought, if we were to talk to him about his courage, Guillaume would shrug, shrug his shoulders, but it would, be, it would be just as false to extol his modesty. His place is far beyond that mediocre virtue. If he shrugs his shoulders, it is because he is no fool. He knows that once men are caught up in an event, they cease to be afraid. Only the unknown frightens men. But once a man has faced the unknown, that terror becomes the known. Especially if it is scrutinized with Guillaume's lucid gravity. Guillaume's courage is in the main the product of his honesty. But even this is not his fundamental quality. His moral greatness consists in his sense of responsibility. He knew that he was responsible for himself, for the males, for the fulfillment of the hopes of his comrades. He was holding in his hands their sorrow and their joy. He was responsible for that new element which the living were constructing and in which he was a participant, responsible inasmuch as his work contributed to it for the fate of those men. Guillaume was one among those bold and generous men who had taken upon themselves the task of spreading their foliage over bold and generous horizons. To be a man is precisely to be responsible. It is to feel shame at the sight of what seems to be unmerited misery. It is to take pride in a victory won by one's comrades. It is to feel, when setting one stone, that one is contributing to the building of the world. There is a tendency to class such men with toreadors and gamblers. People extol their contempt for death. But I would not give a fig for anybody's contempt for death. If its roots are not sunk deep into an acceptance of responsibility. This contempt for death is a sign either of an impoverished soul or of youthful extravagance. I once knew a young suicide. I cannot remember the disappointment in love it was which induced him to send a bullet carefully into his heart. I have no notion what literary temptation he had succumbed to when he drew on a pair of white gloves before the shot. But I remember having felt, on learning of this sorry show, an impression not of nobility but of lack of dignity. So, behind that attractive face, beneath that skull which should have been a treasure chest, there had been nothing nothing at all, unless it was the vision of some silly little girl, indistinguishable from the rest. And when I heard of this meager destiny, I remembered the death of a man. He was a gardener, and he was speaking on his deathbed. You know, I used to sweat sometimes when I was ticking. My rheumatism would pull at my leg, and I would damn myself for a slave. And now, do you know, I like to spade and spade. It's beautiful work. A man is free when he is using a spade. And besides, who is going to prune my trees when I am gone? That man was leaving behind him a fallow field, a fallow planet. He was bound by ties of love to all cultivable land and to all trees of the earth. There was a generous man, a prodigal man, a noble man. There was a man who, battling against death in the name of his creation, could, like Guillaume, be called a man of courage.